Okay, so um, today we're going to be going over uh, three things. Uh, first thing is we're going to be continuing our discussion of calibration, um, the mechanics of calibration specifically. Uh, typically uh, looking at one, one model and showing uh, how multi-realizations are used in the calibration process to arrive at uh, some objective function look at how the effective function can be changed um, so it can be defined uh, flexibly for your needs and uh, looking at how uh, any logic uh, saves away the data um, regarding um, the best test uh, outcome on this far, the best combination of the problem thus far. So we're going to finish up our discussion of calibration. Secondly, we're going to be going on and discussing performance issues with any logic models. Um, what factors do you have to really watch out for in your models because they may make your model really uh, adversely affect your model performance, make it perform like a dog. Thirdly, we're going to be uh, going uh, for our, what may be our uh, second to last uh, Java uh, related tutorial in any logic we talk about methods um, and uh, the notion of the call stack, activation records, uh, which is going to be useful for some lectures next week um, on uh, debugging in any logic, identifying the source of um, faults um, that are causing uh, obvious failures within your program, within your model, and also for discussing uh, uh, profiling which is a, uh, a technique for identifying why your model is taking so long to run. Both of those tools, uh, profilers and debuggers, in, in support of the processes of profiling and debugging, um, make use of this notion called the call stack. And today we're going to be providing some basic understanding of the semantics, the meaning of, of method calls in Java and understanding what the call stack is and uh, how, how it relates to uh, calls you see from one method to another. Okay. Um, so that, that's going to be most of our discussion for today. So to get started, I'd like you to load up this SAR agent-based calibration model that we uh, started with last time. And I believe you should, um, you may still have it loaded in your workspace for, for any logic. Okay. So you recall this is one of the AnyLogic sample models. And you recall that last time we had talked about sort of the motivation for uh, calibration. We had noted that calibration involves exploring some parameter space. Here uh, shown for an example with three dimensions. Um, each of the dimensions is associated with some particular parameter. And within the calibration process, we are exploring different combinations of values for each of those parameters to identify the value for the parameter combination, which yields the best match of the model, the emergent behavior of the model, to empirically observed emergent behavior of a system, of an external system. And the goal of this in many ways is to leverage the sizable amounts of information that are often available for observations about a system, but which don't relate to any one parameter, which don't allow you by themselves to estimate a particular parameter, but which constrain our understanding of what the possible parameter values uh, must be. And we had argued last time that, that um, this calibration process requires a couple things, a specification of, of what are you trying to match, it's empirical data, and some statement of how you judge discrepancies from that data as defined by either a, what's called a penalty function or an energy function um, for those with physics background or uh, defined by a payoff function um, or an objective function that you try to maximize. So that's, that's one thing. What are you trying to match and how do you judge goodness and fit? A statement of what parameters to vary over what range to vary them, and characteristics of the 
desired optimization algorithm. As we'll see, there's some additional components um, that are often added to judge the uh, legality of points within this space, this parameter space. How do you judge what's a legal point? And how do you judge what's a legal simulation outcome? Um, for example, there may be simulation outcomes that are implausible by virtue of their emergent behavior. Maybe, for example, um, some quantity goes negative, and that's implausible, and so you want to rule that out. And so any logic provides ways of, of judging sort of legality of the results. Okay, so um, we want to load in this SIR agent-based calibration, and we remember from this last time uh, that when we're inside of this, and we went to um, main here, uh, we could see this this experiment. Excuse me, this experiment um, called calibration, whose root object is main, whose, whose associated um, the main class is, is the one called main. Um, we noted that uh, in the general tab, it provides information on the parameters to vary the range over which they are to be varied, some information on the iteration count, how many optimization iterations to use, where each iteration could involve multiple what? Yeah, repetitions. Oh, the, the preferred um, terminology within any logic is replications. The preferred terminology, from my experience more generally, is realizations. They're basically runs of the model with different random number seeds, same parameter values, but that can yield different results just because of the vagaries of the stochastics involved. So what this is saying is there's 500 iterations, and then as we'll see, each iteration is going to involve some number of replications as defined by the replication tab. Um, and so we're going to be varying these parameters. In this case, the two parameters. So we have a two-dimensional space that we're exploring. Instead of this three-dimensional space here, it's like we, we're only exploring two dimensions. And, and uh, we're exploring it 500 times. And we're trying to find as, as good as it gets within those 500. Um, alternatively, as we'll see, we'll be able to, to ask it to automatically stop once it gets to a certain estimated level of precision in the results. That will be an alternative. Here we're just telling it, go 500 steps, see what you can find, and declare it a day. OK. So um, within this, uh, uh, within this uh, experiment, that what we were looking at here was predominantly down in this lower region. There's an additional thing that specifies the objective one. And you'll notice here we have a, cho a choice between minimizing some energy function, trying to get some minimum energy state is the analogy, um, lowest energy state. It's like we're, we're in a mountain, we're trying to descend the mountain and find the lowest point we can. Or in this room, we're trying to descend and descend and kind of wiggle around until we get down to the floor. Um, trying to minimize some quantity or trying to maximize some quantity. We're trying to climb up to find the top of some mountain. Uh, so uh, here we can specify this, and in this case it's specified as uh, minimized. And what you'll see is there's a thing called difference. Difference is called on two things here, DS infection current and DS infectious historic. So does anyone recognize what the DS stands for here? Remember this, this convention, which is fairly widespread um, within uh, software engineering of labeling variables where the first, the first bit of that is actually an indication of what sort of variable it is. So it will kind of remind you, oh, I'm dealing with a slider, or oh, I'm dealing, in other words, a reference to a slider, I'm dealing with a checkbox, dealing with a text box, I'm dealing with a person, or what have you. So DS, what might that be? Okay, that's a good guess. Actually, traditionally, in one, one naming convention, D would be used for double. DS here is actually for data set. Okay? And so what this is doing is it's taking a difference between, and I hope this makes sense, between, on the one hand, the data 
set from historic values. So some, some data set we have on number of uh, cases of, of infection over time, for each point, successive point in time, and comparing that to the data set that we've accumulated from our model that's resulted from our model operation for a particular realization okay, um, of the model. So in other words, for each realization, for each run of the model, so to speak, with a unique random number seed for this unique set of parameters, we're going to get out a DS infection current, and we're then going to take the difference between that and DS infectious historic. Now this difference is a built-in function in what's called the utilities area, the built-in method. And we'll, we'll see a bit more information about that in just a minute. But this is where the objective function is defined. Now, what's notable here is that we could define any objective function we wanted to, um, as long as it operates on the information available here after, after a given realization. We're going to see how this turns into a rating or score or um, or uh, sort of measure goodness for each point in the space, how do we, in other words, how do we go from a per realization one to a um, to one that summarizes across multiple realizations for a given point in the space? We'll see that in a few minutes. Okay? Um, but for right now, what I'm saying is that in this tab, this general tab, um, in this objective function, it, we provided a rule, as it were, that says, how do we judge goodness of fit of a given realization? And here we're doing it using two data sets. Okay? Um, you'll notice we're only judging goodness with respect to one particular data set of historic data. In general, we might have several data sets. So this could be difference with respect to successive pairs. Difference of these two plus difference of those two plus difference of the other two. Or you might define your own function, that your own method that says, you know, how to measure goodness of fit across multiple data sets. Okay? So it's a general expression that, that you provide there. Okay. Um, so here it's using a, a built-in uh, function. Now, um, you know, this is something I've, I've been wanting to do for a while um, and haven't gotten around to it, but I, th I thought it's... It's, I think I showed this to you uh, at one point, this sort of interface any logic has, but it struck me that it's very valuable to know about. So maybe I'll, I'll spend just a minute or two trying to um, orient you to it. So I'm going to close my any logic help here, and I'm going to go to any logic. How would I find out information about that, like more about that function? Well, there's really two ways uh, within any logic. One thing is, if, if I'm in any logic, one thing I could do is go to, okay, come on, um, sorry, let me load in this model, um, SAR agent-based calibration, and I could scroll down, um, scroll down here, load it in, and I could use this um, autocomplete function um, to have it fill in um, the information about, about this um, uh, about this method. So if I go to calibration here, and if I'm in general, uh, and I go to difference, and I do control space, I should be able to see information on this, this method. So you'll notice over here, go click over here, and I can, it says difference function, which is always non-negative, reflects to uh, difference between two different uh, data sets. And you'll notice it, it actually defines the value of the return value. It's the square root of the average of the square difference between linearly interpolated data sets. Okay? Um, and so in other words, um, you might have two different data sets which have different data points in them and it interpolates between those. And then it's kind of matching up, um, or it's integrating out essentially over, over time uh, using the data points that are there and finding the sum square difference and taking the square root of it. Okay, so um, it's quite similar to if you have two vectors, so you have some origin, you have one vector, you have another vector, um, and you want to find Euclidean distance between them. So you have vector one, vector two, and you're trying to find the Euclidean distance between that. So it's basically using that, that distance metric. Uh, so uh, 
that's one way to find out documentation here by doing this control space or command space on Mac, I think. Um, and uh, on Linux, is it control space? Does that work, Duval? So, yeah, okay. Um, so the other way to do this, though, that you should know about, especially if it doesn't work, is um, and maybe I could check that out on the Mac. Um, uh, help, and then you do any logic help. Now, um, what you'll find is there's uh, a table of contents. If that doesn't show up, you can you can often do this sort of show and table of contents. Although you have to. It, you have to be looking at something which is indexed in there. Okay, it, it does. And so then the most detailed reference is in this thing called API reference under any logic classes and functions. Um, so um, there's a bunch of information here on um, sort of at a higher level on different functions, which is useful. Um, so time related functions, et cetera. But then there's this API reference, uh, Application Programmable Interface, and that provides detailed information on different classes in any logic. Now, initially, some of this may be confusing, like this, um, this diagram up here. We're going to explain this um, next week, what this means, OK? Um, uh, suffice it to say, it has to do with what's called subclassing. Um, and What you'll find is, if you look at agent here, and you scroll down here on the right, um, you'll find a bunch of information on fields it defines. Like if you ever wondered how it might define random, remember we've used that before, random connected. When we send a message, who do we send it to? It's to random connected, all connected, et cetera. Those are where those constants are defined. And then if you scroll down further, you get definitions of all these methods. For example, get connections. Um, and if we click on that, we get additional information on get connections, what it returns, um, and the statement of how it works, et cetera, get connections number. So this is sort of a uh, comprehensive view of the, of the uh, functionality provided by these any logic objects. Now, uh, uh, much of this, is available when it does this autocomplete. But sometimes you want recourse to this information. And occasionally, quite often, you know, I'll find myself kind of going back and referring to this um, to explore some, some understanding of what's going on behind the scenes. So good to know about. And um, you'll also find, you know, other sorts of information here, like any logic tutorials and higher level description of, of, of how these things work, how the enterprise library works for, for discrete event modeling, et cetera. But this reference is really key for understanding, um, understanding uh, some of what AnyLogic provides in terms of services to, to developers of, of these models. OK, so um, we've been looking here at um, at uh, that component, you'll notice um, uh, it is possible, rather than using this built-in one, as we're doing here, this difference, you can actually define your own here, right? You could define your own method called, you know, um, my difference or called, uh, you know, uh, payoff or what have you. Um, that you could define as a function over here. And um, I think it was only in the late, later versions of AnyLogic they actually defined this difference function. Earlier versions of some of these models actually had custom built functions which performed these things. So this was an earlier version of this model, any uh, SAR agent based calibration. They had a function called difference, and this is how the function was defined. It just iterated over the array and it basically subtracted the value in one from the value of the other. Okay. This is, yeah, this is not as general because it depends on the data points having been sampled at the same times between those two data sets. So um, here we're, we're just uh, iterating through the different sample values for the historic on the one hand and the current 
on the other, taking the difference, and here it's adding the absolute value. So that's actually a mathematically different way of measuring differences um, than the Euclidean distance, um, and it's also less general. The newest version of any logic is a more general way of doing it that allows for interpolation. So, in other words, the historic data may have been measured less frequently than the data you have coming from the model, but you can still take the difference, okay? And hence, hence is built-in function difference. But question? No? How, how would you look up what the active function is for the last three years? Okay, so, so um, what I do, and let me know if I'm not answering your question here, okay? So, in other words, um, I would go here and, um, the, the first thing I would do to find out some information is I would I would call up um, I would call up then so you'll notice by the way there's several of those with that n with uh, two with that name and these are what's this is what's called an overloading of the function in other words um, different from overriding which is another term we'll get to um, in subclass this is an overloaded function in other words there's different versions of functions which take different methods or excuse me different arguments so this one, for example, operates on two data sets. This one operates on a data set and a table function. Okay, the top one. This is operating on two data sets. So if I wanted to find out about that, well, my first recourse would be to, to do this, this autocomplete. I would select it here, and then I would go browse over here and read about it here. Now, if I want to find out potentially more information or read about it, in the context, what I would do is I would go um, go to help and go to any logic help, and I would go down to to this API reference, and um, you can actually search for it here. But something like difference is just so helpful because it's going to occur in a lot of places. I mean, if I search for difference here, um, what I probably find is you know. Um, Laplace, log normal, altering parameter, all these things have nothing to do with that because differences has, um, has other connotations too. You know, it's, it's such a colloquial term. So what I would do is, again, go back to the table of contents and then um, I would go to the API reference here, go to engine um, and scroll down here since this is something to do with agents and so on rather than something to do with the analysis function and you could scroll down to agent here for example um, and here's all the information about agent um, and I believe this is defined okay so it's a good question is this defined in agent or is it defined in um, an active object this is actually a, a, a very good uh, question so let me um, Oh, utilities, okay, okay, yeah, you're probably right then. Um, so, uh, let's go see, if I could scroll down here for utilities, is that, uh, yeah, there we are, uh, utilities, um, and uh, this is sort of a grab bag, I think, of, of different things. I could search for it here and find difference, um, uh, difference, uh, and then there's a bunch of things that involve different, difference of date units, difference in date units, yeah. Um, difference, there we are. Um, difference function, which is always negative and reflects. Uh, so correct, correct, <laughs> correct. Because the any logic library is, it's a jar file like we talked about last time. It's a bunch of class files and you don't generally have recourse to the code there. Now, that has pluses and minuses. On the plus side, it, it, what it allows them to do is to make code more and more efficient over time without worrying that you're counting on some obscure property of it. Right. Um, basically, this is all you're promised. You don't know how it's implemented, so they can go and modify the implementation. On the downside, if this specification isn't clear enough for you, or if you're encountering an error and you don't know why, you don't have recourse to kind of go and see what's going on. Um, so there's some real trade-offs there. Um, um, having recourse to the code, um, as a last resort is often desirable, but it can inhibit evolution of that code base because who knows what you may be counting on about the obscure operations of the code that they may no, not want to promise in the future. Okay, um, so so in short, no, you you have to you have to uh, reference sort of this information uh, here. Okay. Um, 
It's a good question. Um, so, so as I was saying, uh, we can use a built-in one like this difference function, or we can define our own. Either is an option. Um, here, it's actually defined differently using absolute value um, of the differences, um, and and that provides uh, an example. Um, any question about that before I go on to look at, at how this particular example works for defining like historic data? Question? Huh? Okay. Okay, so um, let's go see how the historic data is defined. Um, so if you go over to calibration, you go under, look under functions, you'll find there's something called infectious historic. Okay. Um, this is a function but it's a special type of function. It's a, it's a type of function that doesn't require you actually to write any code per se. Um, it's what's called a table function, okay? And uh, some of you are perhaps familiar with table functions from BenSim or from other system dynamics packages. These are functions you can define graphically that dictate for a given, um, for a given, uh, element of the domain, what's the corresponding value in the range? In other words, we're given x value, it's given a y value. Now in this case, um, it happens to be um, over time, and um, you know, what we have here is a, is a specification of the value of particular times, the value of the x coordinate, what's the value in the y coordinate. Now, uh, it provides some extra little, um, little pieces of functionality. One thing is it allows you to specify how to interpolate between data points. So suppose you only provide you know, a, a, a modest number of data points and, and yet in the historic data and yet the model is simulating at a very fine-grained resolution and we want to compare the two. We want to say sort of what did the model predict versus what did the historic data um, predict. We might want to interpolate between those historic data points and say, roughly speaking, the historic data would have reported this. And we can specify the, the interpolation algorithm there. So um, I don't happen to remember um, off the top of my head um, all the, the different algorithms, but um, linear is sort of the most obvious one. Then there's a spline one, which um, uh, has additional uh, sophistication in the sense that it involves um, involves uh, uh, curvilinear sort of interpolation. And there are certain um, fixed boundary conditions um, uh, over which it, it varies. It has to have a certain um, slope, I think, at the, the connecting points. And the two points have to have the same slope when they catch up. But, but basically, it would allow for more wiggle between some of these things. So suppose you only had points here, here, and here. It would allow for sort of a smooth, um, smooth interpolation in terms of some of the derivatives, uh, and, and then there's—I don't know what approximation is. We'd have to look that up for what the option is there. But the point is, um, you can specify data points; they don't have to be regularly spaced, and you can specify a, a way to interpolate between them that can then be used when assessing goodness of bet. Yes. Is that something I could import? Uh, that you could import to, to use for your own? Uh -huh, yeah, like let's suppose I had a history, I had a cell. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, is yeah. I mean, it's a data set, so I guess yeah. I could, but it's Yes, yeah, so what you can do, you'll notice here that um, uh, you can uh, paste from the clipboard. So if, if you had Excel, you could, it's some data in Excel, you just copy, paste, boom. So that allows you to um, sort of populate this and uh, not have to, to retype it. You notice there's there's a further um, option here on dealing with out of range values. Okay. So the the question here is, um, uh, on the one hand, uh, I want to distinguish sort of interpolation where it's filling in between points, as it were, from extrapolation outside of that range. So if you know the values within this range, we'll try to fit, uh, fill in between a to a interpolation. But if you ask for something that's below, that's earlier than the first value or later than the last one, how is it going to um, sort of identify what the value is? And again, you see that it has several options. It could use the nearest value. It could extrapolate in some sort of way. 
it could repeat, um, I believe, repeat sort of the sequence in a, in a um, uh, sort of just uh, replicated fashion. I'd have to double check on that. There's some sort of custom one. Um, but uh, this allows you to, to have some measure of flexibility in the values. On the other hand, you may want to signal an error if you know it should never be sampling outside of this, you may want it to signal you that, hey, it's doing something illegal. And um, within the next, uh, the, the remaining lectures of the course, we're going to be spending some time talking about this is when you build up a model, um, how, do you, how do you do so in a way that's more likely to, to um, be correct, less likely to have oversights, less likely to have uh, problems in it. How do you not only build the right model, but how do you build the model right? And um, one of the keys to that is, if there's a problem in the model, you want to know it as soon as possible. You want, if, if there's a problem, this is a good principle in your life as well. If there's a problem, you want to be alerted to it quickly, so you can deal with it as quickly as possible. You don't want to just paper it over. And here, um, a signaling error is a, is a good practice if you're quite sure that by the logic of your program it should always fall within this range, then if it doesn't, you want to be alerted to it as soon as possible. It sounds weird, you know, in a, in, from some perspective, you want it to signal an error, but the point is, you know that there must be a hidden error if it's accessing it outside of that, and you want it to translate into a visible failure that you can then go fix as soon as possible. So, um, so in this case, it's a, it has an out of range error, reflecting the fact that by the logic of the, of the model, we should never get anything outside the range, okay? So table functions are really useful. They prevent you from having to write a lot of code to import data, to interpolate the data, et cetera, and they're a, um, uh, a good sort of function. You'll notice that, that um, uh, they're available here over in the uh, palette just as a different sort of uh, a function. And they can be called like any other function. Um, so um, you can call them and, and, and get a value for a given, um, a given point. Okay, um, okay so um, that's the historic data. Now, um, you'll notice that earlier um, when we had this difference, we were comparing a data set infectious historic with a data set from the current run of the model. Let's just see how each of these threads of logic play out, how, where that data set of historic data is, comes from. So if you go again to calibration main and you go to the advanced tab this time, um, what you'll see is a staged set of logic that specifies what to do at different points within the, the broader experiment. So what this is saying is when you're about to run the experiment, what it should do is take this table function and it should fill up the data set from this table function. Okay? So in other words, take all this, take the information that's in that table function and use that to, to fill in this data set historic. Um, and if you go look at data set historic here, um, and that's in analysis data, DS infectious historic, you'll notice that it says do not update automatically. This is all sort of manually uh, filled in here. And it's going to be filling it in with the values uh, from, that, uh, from that table function in this case. So it's going to take those all and, and put them into the Okay, now, what this is saying is before each run associated with the, um, with the data set, now, you have to be careful here, because this says before each experiment um, run. So here we are um, doing it once before the whole experiment has, has uh, taken place. We are going to reset the current objective, reset the information on the best objective. So in other words, we're going to zero out the information on from what we, anything we've seen before on what's best. This deals with, this logic deals with the fact that we may, for example, run this. So I'm going to run this right now. Um, remind you of what it 
So you remember these calibrations. We have some data historic that we want to match here, this yellow data, and we can run it here. And it's trying to find different matches to it. And this is measuring the best so far. Uh, and it's identifying with the red, the, the best that's been found so far. This is identifying the goodness of fit of that best so far. Um, we could then, if we were to stop this. Sorry? Yeah. 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 Uh, I think that that was sort of the fourth, um, the fourth um, attempt. It actually found, or the fourth iteration, fourth the fourth point in space in that parameter space. It actually found was uh, found the best because we've gone sixteen iterations and it found at number four it actually got the best value. It's trying to find better values than that, but the best it's encountered thus far is number four. It's as if um, you know you were uh, climbing a mountain and you've gotten to some peak locally and you're you're trying it's kind of cloudy so you can't tell for sure there's a higher peak but you're kind of exploring around that and it may require you to go downhill a little bit you're following some ridge now that ridge may lead to a higher peak later uh, and in fact if we were to continue on this um, I just restart it but uh, uh, here it's found number okay number five okay now that's interesting um, uh, here it's number four for a while, and then, um, okay, now this is interesting, because this is not going up uniformly. Um, it's actually sometimes uh, going down there, which I'd have to try to uh, understand why it actually decreases from time to time. Ah, yeah, yeah, the, ah, that's probably it, yeah. Right, so these are the two cores. On the on my computer, um, and so one may finish before the other, and so that that's that's probably it. Locally, it seems to be going going up in general. It's just that one may take longer than the other, so occasionally it sort of goes goes back or what have you. So still, number four was the best one, and it's searching around for a new peak. You can imagine it going along a ridge and trying to find something higher. Um, generally speaking, it's going to follow a gradient up higher if it if it finds one. Here it actually got a little bit lower uh, here, so now that's replaced at number four with number 56. Now it's been replaced with number 68. And you'll notice that those, those things corresponded. This was number four, it came way down here. Um, number 56, it came down here. Number whatever it was, 68. And in number 80, it had a little bit of a decrease, I guess, between this and that or what have you. Um, so it's coming down. So this is reporting the best thus far, and that's the objective function. This is for the current one, what's the objective, uh, objective function, and uh, it'll occasionally get replaced by that when, when this, this is below that. Okay. You notice some of the early objective functions were up around 2,000. So we've done pretty well in finding some good values, and by and large, you'll notice trend is somewhat downwards here. But but that's not to say that we don't occasionally go down into a swamp. Um, uh, forgive me for sort of mixing up the, the, the min and the max. Uh, but, you know, occasionally we'll, we'll get sort of way off from the peak we're seeking or, or way off from if we're trying to minimize, sort of get as low as possible, we'll occasionally end up on a ridge or something. Um, but by and large, it's getting somewhat better over time. Um, although, you know, this was actually better and then it started to get worse and et cetera. So um, uh, the point here is that if we were to stop this and I were to restart this, what should happen? If I, if I want to restart, so, so I stop the whole experiment and I say, okay, I want to start this now. It should clear out everything. And so if I start this now, um, it, it should sort of reset what was, what was the best. And indeed, now it's back up to 600. And so, folks, that's why we saw this logic here for before the experiment run, reset the current objective, reset the best feasible objective, the best one it's, it's uh, found, and sort of the, the current uh, value of it.
okay? Um, so, uh, and then what, what we're going to do is that um, um, it's going to be recording now for different replications the, um, the, the best value and then, then combining those estimates for a given iteration, which consists of several realizations of replications. Okay, so you'll recall that ABMs exhibit uh, significant stochastics. And this, yes. Sure. Sure. There's no problem. You want to reset. Yeah. For the different replications, there's no problem with continuing to record. Okay, so that reset. It's a great question, Bill. So the 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 reset here. Um, let's let's stop this for a second. That reset that we saw here. That's before the experiment runs. So that's why I was saying, like, if I restart this whole experiment, it's reset. It's throwing away, essentially, all the information it got before. Right. Now, between, within each experiment, it's, it's not throwing inf all this information away. It's, it's, in fact, storing up some information, like the fact that number four was the best so far and what was the value at that best one. It's storing that up because it needs to in order to sort of keep track of what was the best thus far. So this best feasible objective, um, for example, is, is keeping track of information related to sort of what's the best one thus far and so on. Um, and so it's not throwing everything away there. This throwing the stuff away is specifically when I stop and I'm starting the whole experiment as a new thing. From iteration to iteration, it's actually accumulating data. It's accumulating data remembering what's the best encountered thus far. And, yeah. And there's nothing to stop me if I wanted to keep the different values that it's arriving at between the experiments, right? Uh, okay, so, if, in other words, if I wanted to, so I'm, I'm running this, suppose I say I want to run five different experiments for whatever reason, each of 30 iterations or something like that. Um, Okay, so I might stop it here, for example, after, well, okay, say 32 iterations, and I say, okay, the best value I got was 465, and I got it on iteration four, you know. Um, suppose I want to store that information away, and then for whatever reason, suppose I want to kind of, um, oop, suppose I want to stop it and, and then run another 32 and find that. If, if I want to somehow remember that information, um, there's really two places that I could think, to, two ways to do that, okay? There's sort of a, um, a, a way that, that maybe is a bit more obvious here and a way that's a bit less obvious. So the, the more obvious way um, is you could simply not have this code to throw it away, this reset code. I mean, so uh, let's put it this way. You could accumulate in a data set and simply not reset that data set. You probably do want to reset, you may want to reset these if you wanted to actually start at a new point in space and, and sort of come down and, and, you know, view, have report the best one from that sequence of 32 iterations, forgetting what you, for the moment, what you got earlier, but you want to keep track of what's the best from each successive set of 32. You could basically avoid resetting some of the data sets and keep those around. On the other hand, um, the other ways, you know, you could put it out to a database or something like that and just store that information away. Uh, the, in other words, we don't have to reset. Um, uh, there, there's, there's no uh, correctness reason we have to reset. We're, we're resetting here because we, um, according to the purposes here, we want it to report for however many iterations it's done what, what the best has been thus far. And when someone restarts it, we want it to kind of wipe the slate clean and, and just report for that sequence of iterations. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. Um, but in principle, yeah, as long as this thing is running, we could actually record things across many such sequences of runs and, and report the best received in, in any sequence of runs, something like that. And, and, and I guess like, what, I'm, yeah. what I'm trying to get at there, yeah. there may be a certain seed point yeah. that if I start there over yeah. time, yeah. it tends to give me better. That's true. That's so absolutely. it might be good to, especially in yeah. uh, Okay, yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. So now if I can pick a point, well, heck, if this particular initial condition yeah. tends to give me good outcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or 
starting in this region of yeah. space. Yeah. So like, um, if, if, you know, uh, uh, dropping me in a helicopter, you know, close to the Rocky Mountains is more likely to, to lead me to, to be at a high peak within 24 hours right. compared to, you know, dropping me in the, in the, the uh, Death Valley or something Especially like that. Especially if, you, if, yeah. if you're, if you're thinking about bottling up the system. Yeah. And you're imagine yes you want to sort of keep track of that information like what starting point led to the best outcome so far so so yeah good very good point um okay so um we we could do that we could also do it through a database bear in mind um uh right so uh, we were talking here about stochastics and and a key point here is that when we're calibrating it, we wish to att avoid attributing a good match to a set of parameter values just because of happenstance, just because it, if we only ran it once for each point in the space, we might get lucky for some points and have a value that's unduly good, so to speak. It's, it's, it, it depends on the vagaries of the stochastics rather than on something materially different, something substantively different about that point in space, about those parameter values. So there's, in short, there's a lot of noise that we'll encounter because of stochastic. Well, sometimes a lot, sometimes a little, depending on the model, when we're exploring the space in terms of our objective function. And we want an objective function. We want a, a measure of goodness of each point in this space, in this parameter space, that is in some sense robust to, to these stochastics. In other words, that it's less likely to be thrown off by the noise, by the vagaries of the stochastics. So um, I've made this point before. It came up in sensitivity analysis. Uh, it's also uh, coming up here. And um, to, do, to address it in all these cases, what we've talked about is using this Monte Carlo approach. And the Monte Carlo approach involves repeatedly running the model over multiple realizations. And what any logic enforces, and um, I don't say this with admiration, but it is, it is what we have to deal with. If we're using this optimization engine, we have it here, we have to take the mean bit of the realization. So in other words, if we have a bunch of realizations um, for a given point in space, and forgive me for going back and forth, it's just I think that the graphic is, is sometimes helpful. If for a given point in this space, um, we, we're going to sample multiple realizations, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Um, and generally, we might want dozens, as we've all noted, but sort of default in this model, I think it's five realizations, which is pretty impoverished. Hey, it's a lot better than one, but, but it's still pretty impoverished. If we were to do dozens, say, at that point, um, for each each realization, we're going to get some objective value, right? For each realization, we are going to be evaluating, to be clear, this difference here between the data set and the particular results we've gained from this realization in the model, the DS infectious current. Because after all, each realization is going to lead to a certain number of people getting sick at a certain point, as a certain intervals. So each realization is going to yield a value for difference. And let's suppose we run um, 30 realizations, and we have 30 different values in for this difference. Any logic takes the mean of them, t 
to judge the kind of goodness of that uh, at that point. And so would it be significant, depending on the size of the the, drug, the absolute magnitude of our various parameters that are yeah. big or cubic, yeah. do we want to impose some kind of design of experiment thinking as mm -hmm. far as where the points we want to actually choose uh, across that space? Mm -hmm. So as opposed to doing right. like this broad shotgun yeah. approach, yeah. we really yeah. want to say, you know, A systematic sample of some sort. Well, yeah. So um, uh, it, it, it's it's an excellent idea, an excellent point. Um, and in fact, in the optimization literature, you'll find devices for doing exactly that. Um, so um, in Vensim, for example, to use another simulation package, um, Vensim does not offer, and it's it's frankly a, a fairly big shortcoming from my perspective. It does not offer this idea of having multiple replications for each point in space. There's a way to do it, but it's really awkward. Um, uh, it's not supported officially. You have to subscript the model by iteration number, uh, by replication number. But um, what it does do is it allows you to define what's called Latin hypercube samples. And um, what that guarantees is that um, at least you'll have every distinct value, say, of, of a, some discrete set of values you specified as wanting for mu, or some you specified as wanting for beta, or set of, that a set of values for, for tau. Um, maybe you want to sample 10 tau values, 10 mu, right. 10 beta, and you're guaranteed to have each possible value for tau represented somewhere. Each value, possible value for mu, each possible value for beta represented somewhere but not all combinations of those possible right. values. Just um, you've explored the extremity, for example, with respect to the upper side of tau, lower side of tau. Extremity with respect to the lower mu, upper mu. Lower beta, upper beta. All those are guaranteed. It's just that, for example, it might pair a high tau with, uh, the only high tau might be paired with a medium-sized mu. Right. And you don't, you're not guaranteed to have be in this corner ever, but you're guaranteed to be on this you know, at this sort of line here at some point, or at this, on this plane actually, at, at, at some point, this upper plane, and at this lower plane at some point. So, Latin hypercube sampling is one of these techniques, and there's, there's others as well. So a more sophisticated one yet would be a orthogonal array approach, or, or um, sort of all pairs approach, where you have all pairs of possible values, but you don't have all possible combinations of those values. And um, uh, any logics used of the OptQuest engine, I believe that uh, OptQuest may support these things, uh, or at least at least Latin Hypercube on its own. But I'm not aware of a way in any logic to directly tap into them. I mean, it would be interesting to look here because um, I've done so much work with earlier versions of any logic. It'd be interesting to look in this latest version, for example. You know. Um, Hypercube. Let's if if we were to search for hypercube here, um, what nothing found. So, um, and if we were to search for Latin, um, we uh, we may not. Um, yeah, this doesn't look. Uh, not sure why Latin. Oh, basic Latin. Yeah, it's just a Unicode reference. Um, so um, so that's a character encoding, and it's not to do with Latin hypercube. So in short. Any logic does not itself support that. I think, in principle, one thing you could do, um, actually, it wouldn't be all that difficult, is to, you could use OptQuest, and again, I, I think it probably supports Latin Hypercube. You could probably use it to call off to an any logic model and get back values from the any logic model, basically do it yourself. But, but otherwise, design of experiment thinking like that is not directly supported right now. So it's, it's a good, uh, it's a it's a good point. Um, okay, so um, and I think it's uh, regret. I regret that, and, and probably something they'll be improving um, over time. They're pretty good actually about taking into account people's uh, uh, people's requests. So if you go to the AnyLogic site xjtech.com, I think they have a mechanism there for submitting requests, like submitting feature requests from AnyLogic users, and you know. I think they actually listen to those things. Um, I know because I've talked to the CEO and um, the rep for North America. 
Um, okay, so you recall that when we had introduced this thing, um, uh, the, the notions of, of, of um, sensitivity analysis and by extension calibration, we talked about a hierarchy of concepts in any logic. Their terminology was experiment, simulation, and replication. Now, uh, a replication involves one run of the model, and a simulation of one collection of replications. In the calibration context, we have sort of iteration, it seems, being used for, for simulation. It's kind of uh, an iteration being a collection of replications associated with a particular specific set of parameter values. Okay, um, so I'd like now to, bearing in mind that terminology, um, uh, I'd like you to go to, uh, again, calibration, go to the advanced tab, and it's scrolling down a little bit from where we were before. And I want to orient us with respect to this set of functionality. Okay. Um, so uh, there's a couple of, of pieces here um, to draw your attention to. Um, so this, we, we've seen already this filling in of the data set historic. That occurs once before the experiment setup because this doesn't have to change. We're not changing the historic data on every, every iteration. Um, there's one set of reference historic data that of which we're making use. Um, but we do have a set of data sets over here um, uh, that are associated with the experiment. Um, they include not only the, the historic one, but DS infectious current, which is actually going to be specific to the, um, to the realization uh, with which we're associated. Um, and uh, DS infectious best, best one thus far, um, and um, uh, DS uh, data set current objective. So we have, we have a set of these. We're going to have some code here. This, uh, as we said, populates the historic data. We talked about this reset functionality. After the simulation run, you notice it says fill from DS infectious. DS infectious current is filled from DS infectious. So here, we're retaining the current value after the realization. Well, this is where it gets, I, I think they're not careful about the terminology. This after simulation run is quite clearly referring after the realization run. Okay? So even though they've introduced this terminology where a simulation can be a collection of replications, this is quite clearly taking place on a per replication basis. Now, suppose we wanted to um, Suppose we wanted to verify that. How would we, how would we verify whether this is taking place? I want you to be thinking about how to debug your code, how to get insight into these things. How would we check if this is taking place, if our understanding is grounded, that this is taking place on a per replication basis or on a per, uh, per simulation, that is iteration basis? How would we, how would we check that? Yeah, yeah, and you could um, you could do this in a couple of ways. So the key point, what you're touching up, though, is you could basically make something visible that indicates, say, when this is occurring. And um, one of the simplest ways is to have a, a message get printed out, like when this is occurring. So you could set this thing to run for one iteration, but say a hundred realizations within that iteration. Okay, um, so. Heck, let's let's uh, uh, l let me do it. Don't do this uh, to screw up your your code, because uh, uh, we don't want to undo it later. But let's let's go do this. So um, this is part of kind of developing confidence that your interpretation cross-checking your interpretation. So if we go to advanced um, and we go to this, what w one thing we could do is uh, system dot dot println. Um, uh, you know, uh, about to populate uh, DS infectious current, right? Um, and uh, if we were to do that, um, and we were to, I can't save it, but we can uh, certainly build it, and it should be fine. Um, and I could run it. Um, 
And the key point, well, actually, I want to do one other thing. I want to set this to run for one iteration and 100 replications, let's say. Okay. So if this is done on a per iteration basis, how many messages should I see printed out? If I, if I did a per iteration basis, I have requested that it shows, it, it runs one iteration. So only one iteration, one message should be printed out. If on the other hand, if it's on a per replication basis, it should print out 100, okay? So I'm gonna run this now. Um, and uh, this is how I, I go back and you sort of figure out these things. Okay, so here it's running at many, many, many times. Um, so it's clearly running at, and if we count it up, it'll be 100. Uh, it's clearly running on a per realization basis. So all I'm saying is you gotta, sometimes you wanna um, be careful about the terminology and, and recognize that it may not be consistent. And second of all, there are ways you can cross validate things. You can cross check things. There's ways you can challenge your understanding and have uh, concrete evidence of what it's doing. So here, what it's doing is after each realization, ladies and gentlemen, it is, it is filling up this DS infectious current. Now, I emphasized this before for sensitiv uh, sensitivity analysis, but I want to emphasize it again here. This, there's something going on here that is easily missed, and I want you to pay attention to it. Um, so this code looks very innocuous, but there's a reason it's copying from one data set to another. This is one data set, that's another. Why is it, why is it doing that? I mean, after all, here's this data set. Why does it have to copy data from that to this one? Does anyone want to venture an explanation for why? Why is it copying from this to this? Okay, okay, so that's true. That, that's true that, that this data set is actually going to be screwed up soon. Um, and so you need to rescue this data from it. But there's a reason for that. Where does this data set live? Okay, so where does this data set live? Well, we can actually look up and see the DS infectious current. Where does this data set live? What's this root thing? It is actually, yeah, it's referring to main, um, not the state, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, but the, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the, 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 the main, the main, an object of the main class. And so if we were to go look at calibration, do you remember? Remember this? If you go to calibration main, remember there's this sort of main active object that says root? So when we say root, we mean, we mean main. That sounds like an odd political slogan, but, uh, <laughs> but, but it's not meant that way. It's, um, uh, when we say root there, we're, we're actually referring to, uh, to main, okay? So, so let's try to trace this logic about what's going on there. It's, it's really good to understand where each of these is coming from. The motivation for this we talked about. It's resetting so that, you know, it tosses away all data. We talked about populating historic data. This is needed because this thing lives in main, and who is when is main coming into existence? The, the main object, when is it coming into existence and when is it ceasing to exist here? Anyone tell me? Is it just main starts up just when you're about to run the particular um, yeah. simulation? The, yeah, the particular, uh, using its terminology here, simulation, the particular realization yeah. of it. So each run of this model with a particular random number C, each realization or replication, you can use those terms here, it's confusingly saying simulation. I prefer to stay away from that because in other contexts it means different things. But each, each replication or realization, when it runs, that's when main comes into existence. Boom! Um, 
and main exists for the duration of that replication. Main accumulates while it's running. What is it accumulating, ladies and gentlemen, of relevance? What is it accumulating while it's running? It's accumulating different. Yeah, it's accumulating this data set here. Okay? DS infectious current. Uh, DS, sorry, DS infectious. It's accumulating as it's running. Um, and once it's finished running, it's going to go out of existence. This is our last chance to salvage that data from it. We're going to have to get that data out before it vamooshes. <laughs> before it disappears, before it exits. Um, uh, and so we then copy that data from, that, from, from within main and we place it in something that lives where? In a more persistent container. The container called... The, yeah, yeah, the experiment. Yeah, that's where this DS infection is currently. That data set, ladies and gentlemen, lives beyond a given replication. That data set lives beyond, indeed, a given a given iteration. Um, that data set is is persistent until we reset it, it could actually live beyond each sort of experiment. Mm -hmm. So the point is, we've rescued it from main and we've put it in in a, uh, a container where we have access to it. And at this point, ladies and gentlemen, where is the information from DS infectious current used? I heard it earlier. Well, we take the difference. Yes, when we take the difference. Exactly. It's used to do, and here we are, come on, um, there we are, DS infectious current, right there. So that's the data set we rescued from Maine. Not, with, no, with no aspirations on the fine state, um, um, a, a well-deserved good reputation. Um, uh, so um, here, from the main object, remember the main. Um, this is uh, this is the data set which contains data we were rescued from me, and and now we can use it to compute the difference. Okay, so we have now stored this in DS infection current. Okay, um, so uh, just to sort of tie this back to what's going on, this data set that we rescued from main. I, I just want people to oops to understand where did that come from? Um, I'm, I'm suddenly uh, here we are. Um, okay, this DS DS infectious. Where does that come from? Let's just trace back the logic. Let's go up to main. Let's go down main. Um, and uh, if you go go down main um, and you uh, go look at the the logic for main. What you will find is, first of all, hey, come on. Um, it contains an embedded object, excuse me, analysis data called infectious DS. Um, okay, now let's, uh, let's hold on for, for a second here. I'm wondering if, okay, this version, they may have tweaked that a little bit, the name of this. Give me a second here, because something's not adding up. Um, come on, get this out of the way. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, back here and let's go to advanced and yeah it's called infectious DS in this version um, so uh, that wasn't driving for a second um, so infectious DS where is that infectious DS sampled from that sampled from this actually relates to Duvall's question from about three lectures four lectures ago infectious DS the data set in main from which we rescue that data just before it vamooshes just before it exits um, we, it is accumulating data from N infectious. What's this N infectious, ladies and gentlemen? That is a, it's a variable that lives in Maine, um, N infectious. And where do you think that variable is set? How does, what do you think that variable contains based on its name? It contains a number of infectious people. And how would, how would you have a variable in Maine that that counts the number of infectious people. There's, there's basically two ways you could have it. One thing is 
you could have it use a statistic on the population as we've seen where, where remember you could define statistics on the population um, of people but in this case there ain't no statistics there so where would where would an infectious be set how would it be set this is a, a pattern we'll see and there's a reason for it we'll talk about yeah state charts state charts so if you got a person where would you infect where would you expect the number of infectious people to be changed or, or adjusted here modified here go infect when they're getting infected um, okay, you don't actually see it here, but you see it associated with this. This, what does this plus plus do? do? It, it increments number of infectious, and when they leave this state, it decrements it. So basically, that N infectious is keeping track of the stock, the size of the stock, and the number of infectious people. Infectious DS is just a data set that periodically updated every two time units is sampling this value. So each time main is running in this realization, it's this infectious DS is sampling this variable. Sampling, sampling, sampling every two time units. It's waking up and saying, time to sample the data set. Um, time to sample for the data set. It's, get, it's reading this value. Then at the end of that realization, we have this code in advanced under the under the experiment running, which takes that data, and it says, oh man, Maine, Maine is it's about to slide into the ocean. Um, so we got to rescue this data, right? Um, and uh, so it goes and it takes that data, and it sticks it into a data set which is safe because it lives in the experiment. And the experiment is lasting between many, many, many runs, indeed replications, indeed iterations, um, of this model and, and uh, of the you know of, of the uh, simulations and and that data set can then be used after Maine has disappeared. Um, uh, it could then be used to assess the um, assess the goodness of fit, and we and we saw how that was done through the subjective function. So, th by virtue of the fact that it took it out that data and squirreled it away um, in this DS infectious current. That's what allows us to do the difference, okay? Um, so uh, that's sort of the logic here. Now, now um, let's see. here we have a thing in the after the iteration code. So um, here we have some further logic after the iteration. Now remember, an iteration consists of multiple what? Realizations. So we have these individual realizations with particular um, particular random numbers going on. Run, run, run. And after some number of those, here it's five, maybe it'll be 30 um, for, for your code, what have you. After you've run that many, you ask, okay, is the current iteration the best that's, that's been achieved so far? And if so, then you fill up a different data set with our, our data set that we filled earlier. So in other words, the number of people infected over time is then used for DS infectious deaths, the best one. And why do you think we're filling that? For this particular sort of toy example, why does that need to be filled? What operationally uses that? Why do we care? For this particular, um, for this particular toy model, why do we care about DS infectious best? Where do you think that manifests itself? We actually saw something that depends on this. And what do you think it is? Riddle me that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It, it was it was it was that exactly. Um, so several of you are are exactly getting it. So let's let's just run this again, and we'll we'll see it manifested before our eyes. Um, um, so so we actually don't see it yet. But watch this. Okay. Um, 
the best one thus far will be manifested when it starts filling in here. Oh, you know what? I did it for a hundred. Um, sorry, folks. Um, uh, let me let me go back and reset. That's why I told you not to do it. Okay. Uh, iterate should count on that, and and then um, and then I want the replication count. I want to set it down to I'll say five for now. Um, that will be fine. Just reset it to its value. Okay. So so let's run this. Um, okay. Um, so okay. Best. Where is best here? Where is that depicted? It's depicted down here, right? See that? That's the red one. How do you think it displays that red one? How does it have the information to display what the shape of this curve is? Where do you think it gets that information? Yeah, it keeps it in a data set. And what might that data set be called? That data set might be called, I would advance, DS infectious best. So that's why it's keeping around. It's got to display it. It's got to display that curve. It's, it's the best, um, it's, it's the curve associated, sort of curve of number of infections over time that's associated with the best fit between, on the one hand, the uh, simulation results and on the other hand, the, uh, the uh, historic data. Yeah. Right. No, it gives the number of infections over time. Uh, no, it, it actually gives, for each of several points in time, it gives the number of infections that occurred for that interval of time. Ex excuse, excuse me, I, I misspoke there. Um, uh, no, it actually gives for point estimates of, of the current number of if the prevalence at different points. It's the number of people who are infected at that point in time. Yeah. Um, no, um, if you want to keep track of the cumulative number, um, well, here, I'll put this as a little exercise for you to think about. So, so let's, let's again um, rewind a little bit. That DS infectious, um, so, so um, this DS infectious current, when it says, okay, I found the best one, it's going to copy that to the best, right? Where is this guy coming from? Where is DS infectious current coming from? Anyone say? It's coming from this guy here. This is the thing that was rescued from Maine, right? It's sort of getting this data from Maine. And so where did this guy come from? It came from this guy, right? It's in the rescue data. Remember, where did this guy come from? We just saw that a few minutes ago. It's not in the slides, but where did it come from? Infectious DS, that was the one that was dictated by, yeah, by the variable main. It just, um, uh, so it's up here, infectious, it just samples this variable in main, right? And, and uh, there's really, a very easy way that we could have it instead of simulating the number that are currently infectious, it could instead be the, the cumulative number. And it has to do with how the dynamics of this variable. So if we wanted n infectious, if we wanted another variable called cumulative infectious, right? Oh, oh okay. Okay, so let me let me just finish the logic here though. And um, I'll, I'll do it more quickly to address that question, okay? Um, and it actually relates to some material that I've laid up for this session. Um, but an infectious here, if we wanted this to be cumulative infectious, instead of the count of number of infectious people, prevalence as it were, prevalent case count, we want it to be cumulative number that have gotten infectious. How could we compute that in a variable? What would be different in the logic? You never decrement. That's all. Yeah, you just never decrement it. So, so we could actually add another variable just like that, and and here, oh, excuse me, just right here. Um, so you for you might have you know get main dot uh, cumulative infectious uh, here, and that's all you need, 
right? Um, it would start at zero and it would just increment every time someone got infected, but it would never decrement. So, so that would be one way to do it. Okay, but Oski's point, Oski's question was more general, right? The question was, when do you use a statistic over the population like this, um, uh, where we have we can define statistics? We could, after all, we could add a statistic here. And this could be called, you know, uh, count infectious. Whoops, uh, remember we did this before? And this could be a count of people. And remember, it's item is the thing. Item, we have to make sure that it interprets this. Remember we saw that coercion thing last time? Item dot state chart um, dot is state active. And we give it a name. Um, it has to know about sort of it's it's in person you could do something like that and that would actually count the number of people who are in the infectious state right now so why do it that way as opposed to with a variable it's a very good question um i will i will tell you this uh, there's trade-offs so defining statistics here allows you to have a point of reference for statistics computed on the on the population, it's kind of a, con a convenient place to show in one place the statistics that, that are applicable. But it is performance hungry. So um, each of these statistics, computing them, requires a, a uh, traversal, a iteration through the population. Traversal over, iteration through, Go, you know, chunking through the population. So imagine if I wanted count infectious, count susceptible, count recovery, right? I can define three different statistics, but to compute those, it has to go through it three times. So if I request, count, you know, to display it, count susceptible, count infectious, count, count recovered, it would have to go through the population three times. And each, each, you know, when I go through it for susceptible, it's going to say, hmm, person zero is, is it susceptible? Nope. Put it down. Person one is it susceptible? Nope. Person two is it susceptible? And and then I'm gonna co have to come back for infectious and say person zero. What state are they in? Oh, they're infectious. Okay, I'll use them. And basically, I go through three times where I could have done it in one pass, right? I could have done it just one sweep, just putting them each in the bin, the appropriate bin. Oh, this one's susceptible. This one's infectious. This one's susceptible. Put it in those uh, accumulate those bits. So. This is a pretty, um, it's a very convenient mechanism, but it's somewhat heavyweight when it comes to if you're calling it a lot. The, the variable option that, that we've been looking at is actually quite lightweight because you're just keeping track when people change um, what, what, their, um, uh, what their status is. Generally, uh, so in change, when they change their status, you keep track of it. Generally, that's lightweight, but there are cases where it's actually fairly expensive. If you're only sampling the status of the population occasionally, and you have people changing all sorts of every which way between those times, you're going to be keeping track of the number at all sorts of times you don't really have to. And it may actually be faster to do one sweep through the population at, at just the points you're sampling. So in this case, I think the model designers were thinking, well, um, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more efficient, perhaps, to have it just keep track incrementally as people get infected and not infectious. Um, I will say another thing. I mean, if you want to keep track of number susceptible, number recovered, number infectious, the logic there, and you have all sorts of connections between them. The logic for like when to increment this, when to decrement it, it can get sometimes a little bit, um, a little bit meddlesome. Imagine if I want to ask, I uh, have an additional category that was like number that have ever been infected or something. Um, uh, you know, it, it's it's not clear that you want a variable for that, which is you know incremented only only here, um, and then um, never decremented when you recover. It's um, so so. There's some trade-offs performance-wise and cleanliness of the model or transparency-wise between these. Um, I would say in general the variable approach 
is often faster, but it's it often involves more spread logic spread out, whereas this one's a little bit more centralized. But I don't know that that I fully sort of dealt with it in in, um, in all aspects. But those are some of my thoughts. Okay. Um, good question. Any other questions on this? So um, so let me get rid of the statistics here. Um, I think we can get rid of it over here. Boom. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, so this uh, get best iteration, get current iteration, turns out that um, uh, those are, uh, if I'm not mistaken, those are also built boot, built in here. Um, so so let's go um, continue to walk through this. In the interface, um, this objective, what this is reporting is the best payoff, the objective yet reached, right? And these are the values of the parameters that led to that best objective. The particular point in parameter space that led to that uh, objective. Um, there's two additional components here. Maybe I'll come back to this because I, I want to talk about multiple realizations. So this replications tab, you can have a checkbox for use replications. If you don't, how many replications do you think it uses per iteration? One. Yeah. If if you do check this, then you can uh, specify a fixed number of iterations, um, or fixed number of replications or realizations per iteration. In other words, per point of parameter space that you're evaluating, how many times the model is run, the different random number seeds for that. You can either specify a fixed number here I've shown it's ten, or you can have a varying number of replications, um, which which is throttled according to statistical criteria. And um, we'll talk about this right now. So, um, hmm, um, I'm tempted to come back to this because it draws on, um, let me, uh, pardon me for just a second because I, um, uh, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm presenting this in sort of the sensible order. Right. Um, uh, okay, good. Um, okay, yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll talk about this first so you see that where this mean comes from, and then we'll go back to that because it, ref it requires reflecting on sort of the statistics associated with the sample mean. Um, okay, so um, uh, we actually did this thing already where I sort of printed out... Um, uh, printed out um, some message here uh, associated with this. And I'm going to modify this. So uh, if I go down to this uh, calibration here, and this is actually going to be a little bit different for this version of, of the model because they've changed it since the one in which I based some of those slides. If we go down here and we go to advanced um, and we come down here, I had this print thing here. But what I'm actually going to do is, um, is instead of just printing this, I'm going to say, uh, uh, and the oops, and the difference uh, or the disparity um, is, uh, and this is going to be sort of the disparity between the two of them, the the um, the energy function, as it were, and I'm going to put in a call here to difference um, and in fact it's going to be the same call that's used here so I'll just take the text from it this difference between these two okay in other words the difference between the current one and the infectious historic uh, values so we're going to go back to advanced and just paste that in here oops uh, paste it in here um, there we go okay so here uh, we've populated DS infectious current, and I'm going to take the difference between that and the historic. Okay. Um, so now instead of just sort of saying, "Hey, I've reached this point," I'm actually going to be printing out um, what the difference was. Okay. So uh, I'm going to run this thing, and what we should see here is there's a bunch of uh, reports here um, on on the differences. Okay. So these are the differences for a particular what? A particular realization. These are the differences for a particular realization. Okay. 
Now, the reason I'm showing this to you is um, uh, if, if you do that, and, and you can actually go look at the values there in the console, um, for example, this 1709, 1143, 1710, 1243, et cetera. If you were to do that um, and uh, take a look at what's reported as the value for that iteration, it's the mean of these values, okay? Um, so in other words, each realization is, um, is getting some value, and then um, uh, that, excuse me, each iteration is getting some value, and that's just the mean of the values associated with each of the realizations, okay? Um, so each iteration, each point in parameter space that's being evaluated for, for calibration is associated with some value. That's why we're iterating over this parameter space to find the best one. And that, that value for that given point is dependent on the value for the realizations associated with that iteration. The iteration might consist of five, in this case, realizations, or 10, or 20, or 100. And it's going to compute a realization uh, a, a rating or score for that realization using that, that sort of code we saw in the objective function, right? Using, using this code uh, we saw um, here. Um, it's, it's using this to develop that score. And we're, in fact, reporting that score in this little bit of code I put in here. And, um, and when we do that, um, we, we actually see the value, excuse me, for, for gosh, where is this thing here? for each uh, iteration, uh, for each realization. And then, if you were to take the mean of these in Excel, and I won't do this because of, of time considerations, but if you were to take the mean here of these for a given iteration, take the mean of them, what you will find is that mean is the value used um, within that interface as the rating for that iteration. So. When we are running this thing here, um, you will find that the value reported, this 1710, for example, um, uh, that, that was there for the very first one. Let's, let's sort of go, go there again. OK, that 1710, that's coming from the mean of a bunch of, of these guys, OK? Um, and, uh, and you'll notice, although here it's reported, excuse me, this, this one here, this 1710. Here it's reporting each successive realization and its value. And then once it finishes that iteration, it reports sort of the score of, if it's the best one, it reports the score over there. And that's the mean of those, OK? So in short, those realization values are boiled down by taking their mean right. to a score for the iteration. And that's used to compare iterations and identify the best parameter value. Yeah, that's that's right. So, so these iterations we're, we're defining there for the iteration is this thing here. Of sort of, we can either say continue fixed, continuous, or discrete. Fixed would be some fixed value. Discrete, we could sort of chunk along it with some step value, um, and uh, and then continuous, it can just sort of vary it within that in that range. I think picking picking values. Um, without being uh, confined to certain certain uh, step or grid size. And is it using any, is it using any um, insight from the previous iteration to yes. pick the next step? Yes, I believe, so So um, I'd have to go refl um, sort of go back and, and cross check my knowledge, but my understanding is that it's using substantive understanding from the last one according to a fairly sophisticated um, nonlinear global optimization algorithm that would be, um, generally speaking, and I'll, I'll just reflect some of the criteria that might be used. Um, so we're going to have to use a consistent terminology here because uh, as to whether we're maximizing or minimizing, um, either one is possible here. Let's just use whatever this one is. I think this one is minimizing because it's minimizing the sum squared difference. So if we're talking about minimizing, um, for example, the most 
naive algorithm might have it go uh, downhill at the fastest, sort of the so-called gradient descent. It goes down as fast as it can. So imagine that you're on a mountain. You see sort of uh, there's a ridge to your right, but right ahead of you there's a steep slope. Um, imagine you're Spider-Man, so you can um, this may take some some uh, Spider-Woman. Um, you you can go down this sort of steep slope. Um, and you try to go as quickly down as you can um, uh, as possible. But the problem with that is that when you come down that way, you may get to a swamp down there, um, which uh, there's no way to go down from that. And so often these algorithms, for example, will involve some measure of adding some called noise. So they'll allow you to go a certain distance uphill or you have a certain chance of being able to go uphill in a given um, time step, just so you can explore around. Because maybe the swamp is in a little sort of cirque of sorts, and once you get up over the edge, you can go down further. And so maybe this is just a ledge, so to speak, with a pool of water in it. And so that would represent perhaps the, the goodness that the little being able to go up. Yes. Maybe interactive effects that's going on between the. It could be. Um, I think, okay, so, so this is a really good question. Right, so, okay, so um, if we run this, this is a very good point, Bill. This is, this is really excellent. Um, if we were to run this now, um, so there's the early suggestion of Duval that this is due to multi-core that sometimes, okay, this guy can go up or down because it's showing for each replication. So that, that guy's really not terribly constrained. Um, by the way, I mean we can we could stop this for a second, and um, you'll see one seven eight five dot eight one eight. We should see that um, uh, you know listed um, uh, if if we were to go down and look um, look at our um, at our thing here. Um, uh, we, sh we should see that in our list here. But this will go up and down because it's just different realizations for a given uh, iteration that are often displayed here. Um, this one should go down only because this one's only being populated when it's the best one thus far. But I think your point is, like, within an iteration, um, it, may, it may actually get a score that's worse than the last iteration. In fact, you see it right here, right? Like, each of these dots is a iteration. Each of these dots shown here um, is associated with a particular iteration. And sometimes the dots go down, but sometimes like this one goes up, right? But the general slope, I think, is, is slowly improving from it what it was at first. And so I think if you were to run this out you know, for a couple hours, you'd see them cluster on the bottom. And that's a reflection of, it's, it's sort of learning or it's, it's, it's learning what areas of space are yielding the best results of parameter space. And it's exploring those regions more, um, more thoroughly. Um, and so there is substantial um, uh, sort of um, carryover from one iteration to another. I mean, this exploration of space is fairly localized. So there's going to be a lot of, a lot of sort of co-variation that. So, you know, it may sample at this point, and then it may sample at this point, and then this point, and then this point. And each time it's making some progress, then it kind of flounders around here. And then, it, you know, it may go up for a couple of iterations, get worse. And those aren't going to yield the best results directly, but they may allow for a breakthrough, right. which then starts to yield much better results. And these, and then sort of it's on a roll again. Um, so in short, um, there's a lot of sort of carryover of state and knowledge from iteration to iteration. By contrast, realization to realization, there's really no carryover. Right. Oh. You're sitting at that point in whatever yeah. stochastics, whatever stochastics occur. Yeah, there's, there's um, you know, it's it just, uh, you, you've got the same parameter values for each realization, but you know, otherwise they're they're varying independently in terms of stochastics or yeah. So we can be reasonably or reasonably confident that if I put uniforms look across two of the parameters, it yeah. really is gonna spit it may take a bunch of time, but it's gonna give a good look to the entire space. Okay. 
That's a good question. Um, I guess what I'd be concerned about is that it, it says, hey, this one region right. is really right. fruitful. I'm really getting some. I'm going to spend most of my time here. Right. Whereas right. Then maybe there's that little off ramp that you might right. go that if yeah. you went there long enough, you might yeah. find that there's a better yeah. region. Yeah. Yeah. So it might get stuck in the Rockies and never get to the Himalayas or something like right. that, searching for Mount Everest. Um, oh, not here yet. Pikes Peak, you know. Um, uh, but it, it never gets to Mount Everest. Uh, yeah, that can happen. It uh, never even gets to Mount McKinley. Um, that can happen. And I'm not going to say it's going to uniformly explode the space because it's not. It is probably going to be concentrated in those areas that look fruitful. But a good algorithm should poke around enough that um, and have some persistence poking around so that it, it um, you know, tries, tries nearby areas. And if there's any glimmer of hope, it will try to follow it. But it's a, it's a really tough issue, this issue of sort of how to explore really effectively. And one piece of it, which is maybe what you're thinking um, based on your earlier questions, Bill, is, is one piece of it is where do you start as well? Because, uh, you know, you could imagine if, if you just get dropped um, near the Rocky Mountains, and so if I get dropped in Utah by this, um, by this, um, this helicopter, you know, I might go up and down the Rockies, I'll find, find Mount, Mount, uh, Pikes Peak, and I'll find a bunch of other things on the Continental Divide, and who knows, I might follow them all the way up to Alaska or something like that, um, along that ridge and so on, but I'll never get to, to the Himalayas. On the other hand, if you, if you drop me off uh, in a helicopter the 100 randomly selected spots around the world, and I happen to land in the Ganges Plain, and I, I sort of poke around, I may follow the foothills, and, and oh, you know, I'm, I'm starting to get into to the Himalayas, right? Um, so starting points um, are a way to kind of um, or offer extra leverage in terms of thorough explanation, right? And I, you know, this is a really interesting um, question as to sort of how different starting points vary here. And um, I, and I yeah. guess could I also, since I've got the capability to, to, um, to use a fixed, uh, to use fixed start, to yep. specify fixed points, then I could maybe, maybe run this, yep. run it continuous, but then maybe I also want to hedge my bets and do just kind of a, okay, maybe I'm going to take a few, I'm going to explore right. uniformly, but at kind of fixed spots and then compare the two results to kind of... Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you, you probably could do something like that. I mean, I, I'd have to, like, I don't think when you say discrete as the option for exploring, I'd, I'd have to go back and, and, and check. I, I don't think that, like, doing discrete, like choosing discrete here, I don't think that's going to guarantee it does all of them, um, that it has to, uh, I think it, it just, uh, I think fixed will impose what the value is but it doesn't vary it. Okay. Continuous will allow it to kind of vary it anywhere in that range. Discrete, I think, it does a fixed step size. It's on a grid of sorts, but it doesn't guarantee that it's all explored, I think. Um, so I, uh, I think we need to look at the manual um, for any logic, because I suspect it actually is restarting many times. So in other words, uh, so, so if you're familiar at all with Benson's calibration algorithm, there's actually a, a bunch of uh, settings there that you could use. And some of them reflect the fact that when it, so it's going to be trying to, so Benson is a more naive algorithm than any logic. My understanding is the any logic algorithm is more sophisticated. And yet even Benson's algorithm has a, has a, the capacity to restart the initial location when it can't get any further in, in you know, a particular sort of sojourn, it, it just gets stuck in Death Valley and, and things are really, really bad and it doesn't, um, it, it, well, sorry, uh, if we're minimizing, Death Valley is pretty good. Um, but you know, you're, you're stuck at a very low point um, or a very, suppose you're stuck at a, at a point where it can't get any better than you're currently at. Um, then you might restart. And, and, and Benson does that. And it sort of will periodic, 
automatically restart its search at a new initial point. And that's very useful because it does allow you to get that potential to be dropped from the Ganges plane and, and get, get to that closer to that global maximum and then explore there. So it's less likely you'll get stuck in some backwater of the space or even in something that's locally optimal. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Or even if maybe I, I can't physically drop them in a valley, but if I understand the space and just give it, it and I understand where the initial conditions and how things are going to tend to play out just based yeah. on the, the space that they're around, then I can hedge my bets a little bit better. And there may be little things that I can do right. to kind of push them more towards the valley um, and make their life more miserable. Right. So, uh, yeah, you'll notice here in the, just, just sort of uh, to, to, to address some of your questions, I would suggest you, um, you take a look at um, some, of the, um, some of the documentation here, like uh, adjust OptQuest engine settings, um, so fine tuning uh, the settings for OptQuest, um, and it, it talks about um, you know some some ways you might be able to improve it, uh, and in general, I think um, you know t uh, taking a look at um, uh, taking a look at at the documentation might shed a lot of light because I'm presenting some high level stuff here, and I would have to go back and check about how it does things. What I do know is that it's routine for some simulation algorithms to restart, and I think this one may be one that restarts. But you'd want to check that. The other thing you could do is you could quite readily um, have it print out, you know, every, well, okay, here, folks. Um, if we, let's suppose we wanted to get a list, and let's put aside for the moment how convenient it is to parse it and so on. But suppose we wanted it to print out its position and parameter space. Um, suppose we wanted it to do that. How would we do that? How would we get it to print out its value and parameter space uh, for each replication? Let's suppose. Let's start with replication. How would we get it to do that for each replication? Okay, so parameters are parameters of what? They're parameters of of main here, right? Um, so, I mean, one way, and, and this may not be the, the best or the prettiest, but I mean, one way you could do it is um, in the startup code, you could have it print, okay, so what is its, what, is, what are the two things that are being varied again? It's, it's is it infection rate and um, uh, infection probability and contact rate? So up in, up in main, um, down main, we could have it. We could have it do trace ln. Um, uh, you know, uh, we could have it print out the um, contact rate, right? Um, and and then we have a, a comma, and then we could have it uh, the infection probability, right? And and we could have something like that, right? So here. Um, at the beginning of each run, each realization at least, we're going to have it print out what the parameter values are, right? So if we did this, what we should see is, okay, so this is where it's exploring here. This is kind of a, a depiction of where it is. And it's mixed with these messages here, obviously. I could remove them. But, um, you know, uh, alternatively, I could have them tab separated and, well, watch this. I mean, um, I, could, I could say it. I might as well do it. Um, so uh, probably what I do is to make it even prettier. Maybe I'll um, I'll just do this. I'll have a tab between them backslash t, and um, do this. And then what I'll do is I'll remove this kind of clunky uh, excuse me um, clunky stuff here where it's printing that out. Um, uh, hey, hey, um, there. Uh, and then I can run this thing, and it will print things out in a tab-separated form. And I do this with malice of forethought, 
because now I can take this and I can just copy it and uh, here let's, let's let's run this for uh, for a, a wee bit. Um, I'm going to come back to this, okay? Um, That, that's exactly what I want to do. And the reason I said let's come back to that is that um, it would be really nice to do it um, for a couple minutes and kind of you could see what, w how it's exploring the space, right? Um, you're absolutely right that MATLAB would be an even better way to visualize it. But with, heck, with two dimensions, I could just do it in Excel here and, um, you know, um, and just do this insert a uh, scatter plot right um, something like that and uh, <laughs> it's getting around eh um, it's it's traveling around that space um, over a, a pretty good set and you can actually see this sort of trajectory it's it's doing which is interesting That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Now, now this gets um, less um, compelling visually when you have uh, n dimensions. Like if you had ten dimensions of, of parameters, it's hard to visualize that. And you can do principal components transforms and so on to try to collapse it down to a, a smaller number. But the point is that. Um, it's uh, for two dimensions. It's really easy to visualize. For three, you can actually still do it quite readily, and in, in, you know, uh, in MATLAB or what have you. For four, um, it, it starts getting e harder to understand. You can have a, a, a animation of a three D plot or something, but for five, you know, it, it it just adds on. It piles on, but um, you do get a sense that it's it's getting around, right? And um, you know, interestingly, if we had done it using a different chart here, um, uh, okay, this one, I thought it would actually show us the, the oh, I see. So yeah, the, the data points are there. They were just, uh, I couldn't see them, but you could actually see the, um, the data points here. And if I, if I were to, um, can I change their color to be, I don't know, red? Okay, that's, that's a little bit clear where the data points are. Um, and uh, it's sort of going from one to the other. So you could see it sampled actually a fair bit, eh? Um, and, uh, and this is, uh, this is a, a reflection of, uh, you know, it's sort of exploration of the space. So, um, so that's kind of a, an interesting thing to do um, and can lend some insight as to, um, uh, how it's how it's exploring. Incidentally, um, uh, oh, yeah. So uh, an interesting thing that I, I noticed there is that uh, these things actually are exhibiting some variability, sort of uh, uh, point to point. Uh, I would have expected them to repeat. So I'm going to have to go figure out why that why that is, because I would have expected several realizations lead to within an iteration you to get repetition. But I'll have to come back to you on that. Anyway, so you're taking the mean here of the realizations that are being run, and that yields a score for the iteration. And the iteration score then is um, is used to judge whether this is the best iteration thus far. So we saw the logic uh, for that um, uh, right here. If this iteration is the best one thus far, then fill up the DS infectious best. That was used to display that red curve on the lower um, on the lower chart there. So th so that was sort of showing the best one. Okay, so. Um, uh, in short, um, any logic does force you to take a mean of realization results and use that for the uh, for the iteration as a whole. Okay. Um, so um, right, uh, we um, we now are going to go back to the thing I skipped earlier um, and, and talk about this because. Um, 
when we have multiple uh, replications, um, uh, we have a certain number of replications per iteration, and one that we can specify, or we can specify a varying number according to some sort of accuracy consideration. And the idea here is that um, we, we can specify here, and I'll, I'll go back one slide so you can see this. Um, if you look at this option, it's grayed out a bit. What it says is minimum replications, maximum replications, confidence level, and error percent. Okay? Um, and I want to explain how those latter two relate to each other. Okay. Um, so the idea here is that we are going to have some mean value, a mean value of the values of different realizations. Okay? And there's going to be a confidence interval around that that's estimated statistically based on the standard, based on the sample mean of, of the things we've observed and the sample variance of the things we've observed, how variable that is, there's going to be some estimated confidence interval. Okay? Um, and the criteria here is that when that confidence interval gets tight enough, that it's within error percent, so specified error percent of the mean, the sample mean that we've received, then we'll stop. So in other words, you specify this confidence interval. What confidence interval do you want to consider? And what, within what error percent does it have to lie um, of the mean for it to be good enough to, to stop? So how narrow does this confidence interval have to be for it to stop. And over time, as you take more samples, the 80% uh, confidence interval for the sample mean. So in other words, we, we're taking the sample mean of these realizations, and that sample mean, that estimate of the, um, of the mean of the underlying population of, of, of realizations is, is getting tighter and tighter as you take as you take more and more samples, as you go from 10 samples, you're going to have an estimate of the mean of what all realizations would give. It's pretty crude still, or 5, it's going to be very crude. 10, it's going to be less crude. After 100, you're probably getting a sample mean on those 100 that's getting quite close to the actual mean that would obtain if you could just go on forever and take the mean of, of you know, arbitrarily many. So this thing is getting tighter as time goes on, it's the sample mean of the realizations. And, and that sample mean is important, remember, because that's how we judge a, an iteration, according to the sample mean of its realizations. So this is getting tighter and tighter, and at some point, that confidence interval around the of the sample mean, associated with the sample mean, fits within a certain percent of the mean value. And at that point, it says good enough. That's, that's good enough for me. That's going to stop. And it will keep on, on sampling this until that's achieved. And you note here that if, if the values being, being returned are highly variable, this may take a longer. So in other words, if the values being returned from realization to realization are highly variable, it may take a longer time for this to be achieved. On the other hand, if it's returning virtually the same value every time, it may achieve this within two realizations or three realizations. In other words, two replications or three replications. It may get done, uh, get enough confidence of the value of the sample mean that it's within a certain percent of the sample mean that it says good enough. Um, that's adequate. So this is a way of instead of force fitting the um, the sort of runs to to um, only go a certain number of replications per iteration. Instead, it's a way of having it almost more intelligently throttle it so that you secure the accuracy you want, um, taking into account the actual observed variability from the from realization to realization. Okay, so that's the idea behind that um, behind that component, and it's, it's important to recognize we're talking here, as we saw in 
this case about the mean of the values received from the realizations. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so um, that's um, that's the point there with the automatic throttling. Um, and uh, it's important to note that unless you have the random seed enabled here in the general tab, it's going to be returning the same value every time because it's going to be getting the same stochastic sequence. It's the same stochastic process. So, yeah, I mean, if, if, if you were to do that um, here uh, and, and were to take a look at the results, um, you know, and you were to say uh, fix seed, for example, um, what you should get out is uh, basically no gains from running multiple uh, realizations. It's, it's going to basically, you could see it, in fact. Um, take a look at that. Um, so, uh, by the way, while talking to you, I realized uh, what was going on here. So, do you, do you recognize something here? I was thinking that it would be um, printing out the same value five times in a row here. Um, in other words, fi why five times? Yeah, five realizations yeah. per iteration is what you mean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So replications five. So I thought it would be printing out when I looked at the console, given that I'm reporting in main what the parameter values are, I thought it would list it five times, then go on to the next, go on to the next. But this was fooling me. And and I was musing as I was talking to you about why this was, and I, I suspected exactly this issue. Do you see what's going on here? Exactly, exactly. So it's bouncing around. And, and so this is, a, be it fair warning to us all, it's not necessarily promising that it's running each uh, iteration sort of as a, as a whole unit, one replication by one replication at a time, and finishing that before going on to the next. Here, with multiple cores, it may on one core be doing one realization, one iteration, another for another, and, it, and in fact, it may be interleaving um, the realization for different iterations. So this is probably for iteration, the very first iteration, it's doing one realization here, one realization here, one realization here, one realization here, and the final realization here. You notice it doesn't show up again because it's done all five. Similarly, this is the first realization, probably of the second iteration. Um, there you have it again, there you have it again, etc. So if we looked at what I pasted in here, part of what's confusing here is that um, it's like this, this is appearing there, it's appearing there, it's appearing there. So it's not that it's, it's going from this point to that point. It's more that um, uh, these are just different realizations for that. And one thing we could potentially do is try to have it only print out once per iteration. Um, and there's actually a way to do that. Um, so if we were to have it print out once per iteration, one thing we could do, for example, is, I guess it's an advanced, just as we rescue here, we rescue from main the contents of this, we could rescue the parameter values, and then we could use them in this uh, after iteration, we could just print out the appropriate parameter values. So in short, um, we could get them from, from root here, OK? Um, but I've been beating, beating this horse pretty good. And, um, and I, think, I think this is pretty much wrapping up what I wanted to, oh, yeah, there's actually one or two small things I, I skipped. So one thing I skipped was this. Um, so. There's this other tab that says constraints. And the basic deal is um, you can have constraints which basically veto or nix, as it were, a, a given um, iteration based on the values of parameters. So maybe in general you want to explore parameters in these range, but you never want two of the parameters to add to more than three or something like that. Um, or you want some, you have some function of um, of, of multiple parameters that indicates legality of that area of space, then you can have this expression which basically um, uh, 
test the legality of this combination of parameters. And if it doesn't pass, it doesn't do the um, doesn't do any realizations for that combination. In other words, it doesn't explore that point of space. So this is a way of sort of constraining. Like maybe maybe you want to uh, explore these two parameters, you know, beta um, and, and c contact rate. But maybe there are certain regions of this space. I don't know. Maybe it's a region up here that you want to consider invalid, or, or maybe it's a region in the middle that you want to consider invalid for whatever reason. Um, and and you could impose a criteria here that's arbitrarily rich. It could call a function, right? It could, it's just an expression. It could call up to a function and do some computation and say, you know, is this within a certain distance of this other thing or what have you. So that's one thing. That's uh, criteria on uh, con constraints on the parameter values. The other criteria, ladies and gentlemen, have to do with the validity of the emergent results. So in other words, after a simulation run, um, it asks, okay, is this result valid? In other words, like given the number of infectious cases we're seeing, sh could we, should we even consider this a feasible or valid um, uh, a valid sort of result. So whether the solution is feasible. And you might want to toss this out if there's something obviously unrealistic about it. For example, if the number of infections goes above some value, or if the simulation, if it dies out altogether, perhaps, the infection dies out altogether, you know that, um, you know that it's not in fact dying out, um, and you want to constrain it to only those cases where the infection is, is staying endemic or what have you, you could test that. So this is testing parameter values before any runs. This is testing the results after the run to figure out if it's feasible, okay? So, um, and, and if you're gonna have these filled in, there may be some extra logic because you, you, you're gonna have some criteria like, um, uh, and I guess it's, Sorry, it's um, uh, um, so so. There's um, it's also something where you can ask about like get get best feasible iteration and so on. And so you can ask about feasibility. Here we're sort of glossing over this issue, but um, suffice it to say, if you have those criteria, you might want to have additional logic having to do with um, whether something is feasible or not, and just ignore it if it's not. Um, Okay, so a couple of considerations here. Adding constraints helps increase what we call identifiability. So if, if you have more data in general to constrain things, it will help improve your ability to pin, pin down the parameter values to different areas of space, to, to certain areas of space. It'll constrain the possible interpretations of parameter values. Adding parameters to tune increases the size of the space to explore each successive parameter adds a new dimension to the space, which is pretty darn significant. And in too many parameters to tune can lead to underdetermined under -determined situation where you have many possible interpretations of the situation, many possible readings of, of what's going on. And for agent-based modeling, this is a particularly, um, it's, it's something that's worth reflecting on. Because in agent-based modeling, more so than than classic uh, aggregate modeling, we have many moving parts. And we may have data about some situation, let's say in my area ep in epidemiology, we may have data on rich data on number of people infected and number of people dying and so on. But if we have an agent-based representation of the population, if we were to try to attempt to tune you know, parameters for every agent at the same time, there's many possible interpretations of who particular is dying, who particular is getting sick, and so on. It's going to be totally underdetermined. And so when we have an age-based model, often uh, even more so than when we have a, an aggregate model, we have to very consciously try to uh, simplify what we are calibrating so that we don't get just in the situation where there's too much varying and we can't come to any clear understanding. So we're going to have always some uncertainty typically in how it fits, how it um, operates at the agent base level. Um, and then it's, it's worth noting that uh, once you get a set of parameter values that seems to be the best, um, it's worth uh, 
reflecting on the need to be humble, the need to have some humility with respect to those estimates, because that's all with respect to the constraints of the model. It's all with the assumption in place that your model is capturing, is doing a good job capturing the dynamics. So that doesn't necessarily give the true values of those parameters. If your model's off, it may affect the parameter values that are estimated. And so to that point, yeah. let's say that I've got, let's say that the, uh, the data for death that yeah. I have is at the county level, yeah. some higher level. Right. So in that case, what I would, would it be wise then to make sure that as opposed to trying to get at the individual agent level, yeah. that what I really want to do is like, just kind of do an apples to apples comparison and, and apply it and make sure at, at that level that I have data for it. That's what I'm trying to get as opposed to trying to shrink down and say that I'm going to apply some, you know, for any given agent as it were. Yeah. Apply that probability at the, age, at the individual agent level where, where I'd rather just make sure that it kind of fits at the... Yeah, I, I, I may be understanding what, what you're saying there. Um, so, so, I mean, part of what's going on here that's a, a, a different from with classic uh, aggregate modeling is that with classic aggregate modeling, um, what, we, uh, what we have often is a closer match between the, the empirical data that we have, so maybe at the county level, and the data that's coming out from the model. That doesn't necessarily mean a one-to-one -one match that, you know, uh, um, a value for a given stock will directly map to the data we observe. It may be the sum of two stocks or of three flows, you know, correspond to the number of the rate of incident counts over the last month or something like that. But but often there's a there's a, a, a smaller number of pieces of the model that might be summed together or summed and divided, you know, normalized or whatever, such that they match the empirical data we have. And and um, and uh, because we have that that kind of more direct mapping, um, calibration is often something that, that is going to involve fewer parameters, because there's fewer parameters that affect those kind of couple little pieces of the model. Um, by contrast, in an agent-based model, if we're thinking about something like county level um, you know, prevalence, the uh, number of people who are, who are, who are currently have diabetes, or, or incidence, number of people who have come down with the flu in the past month, or whatever. Um, uh, those, those quantities are going to be, in an agent-based model, the sum of a lot of individual level phenomena. And it's going to be sort of, and it's going to need to be aggregated up to then compare it to the em empirical data, right? And we have to be, uh, we have to be cautious about using kind of a knee-jerk reaction, using our sort of the techniques we use from aggregate modeling and saying, okay, well, you know, everything's at the agent-based level, uh, the agent level of individuals, so we'll tune everything at that level, um, all the parameters at that level, um, you know, even for different agents or what have you, to get the desired results. Because there's many possible interpretations. Is it John who got sick, or Mary who got sick, or Mary's mother who got sick? And, and all these sort of different interpretations. And frankly, the data is never going to be able to tell us, um, you know, aggregate data like that is typically never going to be able to tell us about the person-to-person -person details, the state of the population, in the same way that that sort of data could tell us, taking a stock and flow model, an aggregate stock and flow model, it might be able to pin down the initial values of the stocks, or you know, the value of the stocks at any given time, because it's it it has to be those stocks of that value for you to see this data. But at an agent-based level, you're never going to be able to typically uh, well, typically you're not going to be able to determine the full state of the population based on the high level empirical data. Almost never is going to happen. So what you're instead doing, and I think this is maybe what you're getting at, is um, the parameters that you'll be tuning may be parameters that are, there's say one parameter in the model uh, that might be uh, people's um, uh, you know, people's uh, likelihood of, of getting infection, given ex getting infected, given exposure, or something, and you will typically have to make some assumption like that's the same across different groups of people, or what have you, so that you have a, a less big parameter space. You can't afford to tune that for every person independently. Right. 
you know, there's Mary's chance of getting infected, giving exposure, and then there's John's, and then there's her mother's chance, and, and we're going to tune them all together, forget about it, you know, as they say in New York. Um, you, you, you can't tune those all together because it's just too big a space. So you're going to have to have higher level parameters which are shared by sets of agents or what have you. And so I think that's kind of what you're referring to, that there may be higher level quantities that, that need to be adjusted rather than thinking purely at the individual level. Yeah. So yeah. So I could try it, model out the exact city, this is the neighborhood. Yeah. But probably better just to come up with uh, probably about good enough. Yeah. Yeah. And then kind of work with the things that I think. That, really that's right. So typically you're not I mean, there are exceptions if you have massive amounts of data at the individual level, like on people's right. contact patterns, then it's a different ball game. But if you're just dealing with aggregate reports, you're never going to be able to determine from those reports exactly what the connection structure is. You know, Mary's mom has lots of contacts, and Mary only has one to her mother. And you know, you're never going to be able to kind of, um, as as we'd say uh, in physics, go back from a sort of a, a inverse scattering problem. You're never going to be able to sort of figure out what those networks must be to yield those results because there are many networks that could have yielded those results. And this is in, str in, in strong contrast to the situation with aggregate model, where there, we can often leverage this high-level data to uniquely determine the state of the system in as much as it's described by the aggregate model. So you can uniquely set, okay, the state of the system must be such and such. It's a, it's a um, you know, uh, well-determined problem. Whereas here, it's an underdetermined problem. There's just too many possible interpretations to determine the full state of the model. And so, uh, uh, exactly as you're saying, you might want to sort of say, okay, we're going to posit this type of network structure that is scale-free, and we don't know exactly who the hubs are, but we'll posit there are some hubs and so on. But, you know, you've got to get away from that um, assumption that you're going to determine the full state of the population. Now, um, uh, it's, it, I, I want to make a, a statement here because uh, people sometimes get a little bit confused. And, and people sometimes say, well, look, you know, um, aggregate modeling, we, have, we do have the ability to estimate you know, the state of the full population. And that, that's a great thing. I mean, it's, it's a very powerful thing. We can use it for Coleman filtering, for example, to, to good effect. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, someone could could say, well, the advantage of agent-based modeling is supposedly that you can have this rich, heterogeneous population and these network structures, but um, if what you're saying is in calibration you have to tune assumptions that embrace multiple agents, like um, you know, the fact that these agents uh, share a certain uh, likelihood of infection given exposure, what's the use of agent-based modeling you know, if, if you're imposing this one parameter on all these agents? And, the truth is, though, you can still have great advantages by sort of distinguishing agents in the population. It's just when it comes to calibration, you have to keep humble and you have to realize that, that the quantity of data that we would need to specify things at the individual level is typically not available to us. And so we have to start <coughs> in a sort of rough way with, with um, assuming a certain measure of sort of shared attributes. But we can choose what attributes we're considering sharing and um, we can also uh, have a fair degree of flexibility in terms of like network position, et cetera, for different agents. So we don't have to assume everyone is the same or everyone's uniform um, to, in terms of calibration. We just have to make some simplifying assumptions. And sometimes we do with individual level data. Like we have data from Saskatchewan on TB for 44,000 individuals, you know, on, on sort of network aspects of their networks. And that's powerful. Um, so sometimes we do have individual level data. When we don't, we really uh, need to abandon this idea that we're going to be able to determine the state of the model uniquely. Okay? Is that, is that helpful? A any other questions on this before I... Um, I um, uh, wrap up. Oh, oh, a few other, other, other things here. Okay, maybe I'll.
Maybe I'll just continue if there's no questions right now. Um, okay, so it turns out calibrate. I've spent a huge amount of time in my life calibrating models, calibrating dynamic models. Um, and it's a really interesting exercise. Um, again, it's one of the most valuable parts of modeling because it's when often you are woken up and it says the model just won't jive. It just won't work. you got to go back and rethink your assumptions. It's bittersweet. It's painful for your schedule plans. It's powerful for your learning. And that's the most important thing, the learning. Um, and after all, what better way to extend your schedule than to learn, and to, to learn substantively about the issue? So I would argue that it's, it's a great advantage when we, when we see that you know, no two ways about it. We have to challenge either the data or our assumptions. Um, now, um, often you will run into problems with calibration. And I assembled some slides here based on my experiments uh, with calibration. I, I've gotten a lot of experience with it. And it turns out if, you're, if you know what to, how to approach certain issues, you can quickly zero in on what's going wrong, and you can use that to enhance your learning. Otherwise, you can just sort of wander around, and you don't know why it's not matching up, and it's just, it's just you know, um, you squeeze the balloon here, it pops out there, you squeeze it there, it pops out here. You don't know, you, you don't get really get any, any insight as to what's going on. So there's a couple of ways that, that if you're running into calibration problems, this is dealing with calibration problems, that you can gain insight. Um, one of the best ways is you say, um, okay, this thing's not calibrating adequately. I think I could do better than it. So, so if I'm unhappy with it, so, so what, what do you think you could do better? What's your better interpretation? And so often what you can do is ad adopt the best values it's identified and then try to adjust them so that you think you could do better. Um, and if you find that you can improve it, that's a sign that maybe the parameter space is too large. That that you've actually had some insight you're doing better than the calibration. Calibration is having problems. I've almost never found this is the case. Normally, when I tweak the parameters such that I think it should improve, it gets worse. And then I try to see, okay, how, why did that make it worse? I thought it would make it better. What actually made it worse? And often, the model isn't responding in the way that I anticipated from the parameter change. It's responding in a counterintuitive way or a way that I thought I, I, didn't, I didn't expect. And because of that, I, I learned, oh, okay, so that's what it's running into. That's why it can't do any better interpretation of the situation. Because often, I guess I should say with calibration problems, often what happens is it gets to a certain point and, and like it can match this, but it can't match that. And I can't understand why I can't match both at the same time. And when I try to make it match both at the same time by adjusting the parameters, I find, oh, this is the problem. That, you know, if I, if I bump this up so that it matches this part of the data, that inevitably causes this to rise so it doesn't match this other one. Um, and so often you find it just shifts the discrepancy from one thing to the other. Um, and so some assumptions about the model structure may not, or other fixed parameters that you haven't varied, may not allow the variables to simultaneously match. May not allow those two components to simultaneously match. And it's a very interesting thing when you find this, because you get this kind of gut feel for what it's running into. And you get a sort of sympathy for the calibration. Oh, you know, um, that's why it's having such trouble. Um, Here's another strategy that, that I do. So this is kind of the manual tweak the best parameters. Um, so if you think you're so hot, you do it, you know, and, and, and you find, okay, you know, um, often you're not as hot as you thought, and, and what you learn from that. Okay, um, so you get sympathy for the calibration. Here, set very high weight on things you want to match. We talked about weighting of matches. We didn't see that thus far, because we were only matching one thing, and there's, there's really no gain from, from putting a higher weight or lower weight on it because it's the only thing being matched. There's, there's nothing else to compare it to. But when you have multiple things being matched, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, if you had multiple things being matched here, if we had something like this, difference of these two plus difference of, you know, 
um, say death current and uh, so we not only have counts of, of number of infectious people but you know DS death historic obviously I don't have this data in the model right now but you can imagine that case now if I had that right now they're weighted equally this difference is equal to that difference but you know I could make the, the ones for death weighted one-tenth as much as the ones for for uh, for the uh, point estimates of infectious cases. Um, so if you have weights, and I would encourage you to use weights if you're matching more than one thing, um, adjust the weight. So if, if it's not matching good enough for both, if it's matching poorly for one of them, bump up the weight of that. Bump it up really high, and then see what it does to the other match. Again, this is kind of like squeezing the balloon in one place. You see where it pops out, but you do it in a very controlled way. So you set this weight high, see where it pops out for that. Set that weight high, see where it pops out. And again, it gives you some understanding on, okay, so that's the fundamental trade-off here. That if it tries to match this, these other parameter estimates are high, and so now it can't match that. If it tries to match that, those parameter estimates are low, and then it can't match that. That's really helpful, and it's uh, very easy to do with or um, uh, I said see all other weights to zero. So this is just the extreme of this. You only have one weight that's not zero. All the other weights are zero. Can it possibly match the thing you want it to match? Sometimes you think it's a trade-off between matching these two things, but then you find, oh, even if, even if it totally ignores those other things, it still can't match this. Maybe you've got a model that, you know, um, can only exhibit certain modes of behavior, and and uh, there's no way it can match um, the sort of thing you're you're asking um, asking it to match. So um, that's just some comments. Here's some other um, experiments. Increase the parameter range. Maybe your parameter range is too tight. Particularly, ladies and gentlemen, if you have some uh, parameter estimate that comes out of calibration that's on the edge of its range, it's on the the, the very edge of the legal values. You allow it to vary from 0 to 1, it's at 1. You allow it to vary from 1 to 10, it's at 10, or it's at 1. Um, you might want to wonder, okay, what's going on here? Like, why is it like the end of that range? If I were to extend that further, would it go much further, etc.? Um, increase the number of parameters. Maybe it's too constrained. You got to do this very carefully, though. Um, Examine the impact of change model structure. Add an additional state in that state chart for people who are exposed but aren't yet infectious, for example. Um, allow people to die instead of just assuming that that um, everyone survives, what have you. Um, run for a larger number of optimization runs. Maybe it's not just not running uh, far enough to get to find that peak of Everest. Um, and then find other estimates for uncertain parameters. Maybe there's some you're estimating a whole bunch of, uh, of, of parameters um, through calibration. Maybe you can find better estimates, put in rough and ready estimates so you're not trying to calibrate so many. Um, okay, so cross checks. Aren't calibration values unique? Um, like when you run it from multiple starting points and it gets to a very good value, does it get to the same estimate? the parameters, are they totally different? Um, do the different interpretations lead to parameters that trade off in some structured way? So either this is high and that's low, or that's low and this is high. Um, uh, I'm sure to phrase that differently, but you know, A is high and B is low, or A is low and B is high. Um, and uh, you know, if you have different interpretations, if you have two matches, a high, low, B low, or, or, or A low, B high. Um, see if you can get some external validation for it, collect more primary data. Um, you might be able to impose additional constraints. You might be able to simplify the model um, uh, in some, some ways that will, for example, instead of having B, B and C, a, a beta and C is two different parameters, you have beta C. Um, um, may allow you to uh, to have a simpler calibration problem. Um, right, so we talked about calibrated parameter values at the edges of the range. Um, 
to deal with those at the edge, you can relax those constraints, you can collect more data on plausible values, you can question model structure. Um, so often that's a sign of, of some latent issue. It could be a problem with the model, it could be a problem with the that you have overly binding constraints. Um, right. Um, uh, okay, so um, this is this was originally written for Benson, but it applies just as well to any logic. Uh, um, well, okay, in, in any logic we have more freedom. If we want parameter B to be adjusted during calibration to be at least as big as parameter A, maybe we want parameter A to be adjusted. And parameter B will also should be adjusted, but it should never be below parameter A. Okay? Um, there's two ways we could do this. Um, so in any logic, in Benson we can't enforce this constraint using typical machinery um, because the range limits for parameters in Benson need to be constants. In any logic, how would we do this? How do we do this? How do we enforce that A has to be bigger than B, for example? We could use like um, when we type in the value to be to be like maximum um, mm. this value or that's true. The value of a. That's true. So yep, we could we could uh, do it with the maximum. Um, it turns out that we could also it's a little bit uh, a little bit less efficient, but we could do it right here. Remember this thing where. It judges whether it's it's a um, it's a if, if it matches the constraints needed to do a simulation. Is it a legitimate set of parameter values? We could actually do it there, but I like the approach that was suggested. So um, you can do it with a max. Another one is um, you could have a ratio, for example, um, a parameter that represents the ratio, and that parameter is one or greater, and and so you adjust a and then. B is determined by this ratio, also calibrated ratio from one and above. Um, B is just A times that ratio. And so you're, you're adjusting now two, two um, parameters. It's just that instead of being A and B, it's A and this ratio, where the ratio's minimum is one. Um, so you could do it that way. Um, another thing is, like, suppose you have two more parameters that need to sum to one. Maybe it's the fraction of the initial population and certain number of stocks or states or what have you. Um, and uh, if, if, if you need them to sum to one, you don't want to pick them independently and say, oh, do they sum to one? Nope, throw it out, throw it out. Um, that would be wasteful. So instead what you could do, for example, is um, you could take, uh, have value for one and then have the other be one minus that one, for example. Or if you have, if you have N that need to sum up. It's it's actually a little bit more tricky, uh, but you could, for example, draw three three values and then sort of uh, normalize them. So, so maybe we have three that have to sum up, and so we could draw A, B, and C randomly, and then have one parameter be a fraction A over A plus B plus C, another be B over A plus B plus C, etc. Um. Um. Yeah, calibrating initial conditions is one of the best things to, to calibrate, um, and it applies in an agent-based model as well as system dynamics. Um, I should probably say just a little bit about calibration regression, because sometimes calibration strikes people as very similar to regression. Um, so uh, in regression, linear, logistic, nonlinear regression, we're seeking to find parameter values that allow the best match of models. It has the same sort of feel, of, in a way, of, as curve fit. Um, uh, but um, for for nonlinear simulation models, um, as in nonlinear regression, there's no closed form solution that will give you the best parameter values in a symbolic form based on the definition. The big difference for a lot of regression models is that and I'm not dealing here with uh, non-parameter. Um, not that I'm dealing here specifically with sort of uh, explicit parameterized models. Uh, the functional form in many cases is, uh, is given explicitly for regression models. Whereas for simulation models, the behavior, and this is a deep point, and it's one I haven't really emphasized, but it's a deep point. For simulation models, the behavior is only implicitly specified. For example, uh, in stock and flow models via differential equations, um, it's only implicitly specified by the structure of the model. The model output is a complex 
emergent property of the structure. It's a complex um, property that can't be anticipated analytically. So, well, in regression, even for a dynamic, uh, a model that involves time, we will often have the functional form specified that we're assuming this sort of variation over time. For a simulation model, the behavior over time, it, we can't just look at the model and say what that behavior is over time. We have to simulate it in order to, to, to gain insight into that behavior. So in simulation, we are, we have in, in a way an implicit statement of the behavior of the model where that behavior is an emergent property of many different pieces of the, of the model. And um, we can't specify the functional form of the solution directly. In other words, we can't write out that the solution to the agent-based model, uh, that the behavior is going to vary as you know, some, some exponential um, you know, of, um, of alpha times t or something like that. We can't write that out. It's, a, it's an emergent property of all these state charts and all these messages and of all these events going on, et cetera. So that finishes up my uh, calibration um, comments. Um, now, my, it was my plan here to...